All right, welcome to the Spine Conference. Today's discussion will be revision lumbar discectomy. Um, it's a case that I rolled through recently. So, um, as usual, just interrupt me if you guys, if anybody has any questions, if they want to make any comments. So, this is a 47 year old man with left thigh pain, was his chief complaint. Um, his symptoms were about um, six weeks, and his medial thigh is numb. Um, his past medical, no symptoms on the right. Past medical history, high blood pressure, uh, hepatitis C, which was successfully treated with medications. So, um, Ocean, what would you do um, with this man? So, just thigh pain and numbness is his biggest complaint? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I guess going through the, the general history and physical of, you know, um, how long the pain's been there. Uh, As an orthopedic surgeon, what is in your mind right now? Where is it coming from? Uh, what other joint could it be? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, what would you do on exam? Definitely examine the hip thoroughly, checking range of motion, internal external rotation, flexion, um, and then kind of go into the back stuff after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, what would one other condition not give you thigh pain, more lateral thigh pain? More yeah, lateral, like, bursitis. What else? Uh, Greater trochanteric bursitis, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? For lateral thigh pain, or any kind of thigh pain. your lateral thigh pain on this. <laughs> It's very common and like especially in obese people. Anybody? Moralgia parasthetica. Right. Moralgia parasthetica, lateral, lateral femoral retain yeah. nerve irritation. Okay, especially a big guy, a guy with a big gut, where's his belt? Right. And the belt's pushing right on the iliac crest and you can have anterior lateral thigh pain. So it's something you gotta think about also. Okay. okay. The, the other the other thing uh, on exam is um, I make everybody walk. I can tell if someone has a hip problem or a spine problem just by the way they walk. Right. From hip, hip patients, do you agree with that, Paul? Hip, hip patients, I think, limp a lot more than lumbar radiculopathy patients. You have an obvious limp, a Trendelenburg list. Um, it, it's quite obvious if you have people walk. Well, the two questions I ask patients. All right, what are the two questions we ask for hip pathology? Um, have they seen someone else for their hip? No. Anybody? No, the two questions I ask are, do you have problems getting in or out of your car? And very often, you know, yeah, it hurts to get my leg in the car, okay? That's one thing, and yeah. going upstairs, oh, okay? Socks on in the morning. Sorry? Socks, socks. yeah, socks. Right, so these are questions that right away, you, and you should always ask any time a person has proximal thigh-type symptoms versus, you know, below the knee. You know, they're worried about upper lumbar radiculopathy, often confused with hip pathology. Okay, always ask those questions. This is three, socks. Steps and car, and also when you'll see them, they, they when they move out of the chair, a lot of times they they, uh, they they lift their leg. They say, "Yeah, when I have to lift my leg up to get in the car." Okay, so um, he doesn't have any of those, and um, he's a construction worker, a uh, very muscular man. So who's going to read the X-rays? Um, move on to uh, Brett. So this is an AP and lateral of the lumbar spine. I don't okay. see any like definitive disc space narrowing. I don't see any osteophytes. Um, disc kites will maintain not much in the way osteophytes. No spondyl of the seats on the lateral view. Okay. So this is for Brian now. Ready, Brian? Is L4, L5 normal on the AP view? Uh, so you got, you can see like a little bit of a signalization of L5, mm -hmm. um, which means that you might be putting a little bit more stress through L4, L5 junction because there's probably a little less motion at that L5 that's one. Okay. I think it's subluxating a little bit to the left. L4 is slightly to the left of L5, Good slightly. Thing. Yeah, lateral diseases. And um, flexion extension views, um, there, there is motion and nothing abnormal, I think. Did we miss anything, uh, Dr. Sexton? Okay, so um, sagittal cuts, who wants to uh, read through this? Oh, so what would you do as this patient, Ocean? Back to Ocean. Comes in your office, your first year attending. Yeah. Just send him to your partner or you want to take care of it? 
Okay, what are you gonna do? Uh, we can always start with the trial of data management, you know, um, active notification, anti-inflammatory, special monitor, something like that, besides physical therapy, things like that. See if that improves your radicular optics. Um, okay, what about, what about examination? Or what about the examination, right? Or what is Correct, I thought we were fat, I'm sorry. I let's let's go to the exam, well, how was your exam then? Um, so just getting a good neuro exam with uh, motor strength in the bottom lower extremities. Um, then a sensation as well, so seeing exactly where that numbness is and what dermatome. Uh, then moving on to just you know reflexes um, and kind of upper motor neuron side deeper cord in terms of chromis and the like. Um, kind of going from there, making sure you're not missing anything. I want to ask um, something specific on the exam. Frequently in spine, we do things called nerve root tension signs. We kind of pull on the nerve root and see if it hurts. So the typical for this man who has thigh pain, the typical nerve root tension sign of extension. Straight leg raise, extension of the knee or ankle. Is that going to make him hurt? When you, what, so when you move the, when you extend the knee and the ankle, what nerve roots are you pulling on? Extending the knee and the ankle. Mm -hmm. It's more L three, L four. What, what, which which nerve roots go to the foot? Well, that's the quadriceps. So the, he's asking what your tension. If you do a flip test or a straight leg raise test, what do you what do you pull on? What do you pull on? What nerve roots go past so, the knee? Uh, like L five. L5, S1, S2, right? Because right? when they're down in the foot, so when you, yeah. so in this guy, will that do his typical no. work? A little proximal, right? Yeah. So what would you do? Um, How can you pull on those nerve roots? You extend the hip. Um, you can extend the hip, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's um, a way to pull on it. That's right. You're right. So just a typical will not work in this man because right. it's an upper it's an upper level. Right. Call the reverse straight leg raise test. Okay. Okay. Where you hyperextend the hip to stretch the femoral nerve, which right. is upper thoracic, right? Which right. is your upper, uh, you know, thigh. They didn't have to leave prone on the exam table. Right. Yeah. All right. Good. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So. Um, Let's do the MRI now, Ocean. What are these views? These are uh, sizable cuts of the lumbar spine, um, both T1 and T2. Uh, I don't necessarily see any significant, um, or at least any kind of disc herniation causing significant central uh, canal stenosis or kind of impingement on the nerve roots there, the called equina. How do you know you're in the midline? You didn't say you're midline, I but. I didn't say that, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, How can you uh, tell? What's this thing? What bone? What part of the posterior spinous process? Yeah. So that kind of tells you you're in the midline. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't necessarily see any kind of significant, at least in the mid sagittal cut, uh, any kind of compression. So maybe it's just there's something more lateral, maybe in the brain. Okay, here's more lateral. So I, I in my notes, I call this parasagittal cut. I'm not a radiologist, but. I do look at films. So it's kind of not the best quality of MRI, uh, or maybe that's just my lack of. Don't be critical of the radiologist. Yeah, don't be critical. There's a radiologist <laughs> in the room. What do you think of this foramen? So this is the L4, L5 foramen. It looks pretty naked. Mm -hmm. So that's the L4, L5 space mm -hmm. coming out. That should be uh, so lateral, so that should be L4. Four. Yep. So that's just below the number of tentacles. Correct. And what could it impinge on that? Um, any kind of facet joint hypertrophy. Uh, facet in the back. Disc right here. Yeah. yeah. The typical most common area that we see stenosis would be along the lateral recess. Okay. So we're seeing that that's the L4-5 hemisphere. Right? Right. Okay. If you get lateral recess stenosis at L4-5, this is four five. This is the four five lateral recess right here. Um, so it should be. Which nerve root is right here in the in the foramen at L four L five? This is the L four L five disc base. This, I think this is what Messon is getting at. This is the L four L five disc base. Yeah, so maybe it's L, actually L three. Well, the L4, L5 disc base, where's the pedicle? 
At the L405 disc base, is it higher? Is it lower? So L405 disc base, yeah. where's the pedicle? L4 pedicle. Let me go back to the pedicle. The initial answer is correct. So that nerve that uh, Dr. Antonius pointed out, right? That is the L4 nerve, right? It exists below the numbered pedicle, right? And now, for the uh, <coughs> the spine, that's out the door, right? Okay, so that's leaving. Four pedicle, right? When he says numbering so means four the pedicle. Lateral recess, the lateral recess, lateral to that cut, or is it medial to that cut? Should be lateral to that cut. The lateral recess of the spine. More this is this is out the door. This is the lateral. Just so you know, this is the lateral recess right here. Yeah. That's more medial. Yeah. More medial. Yeah. Right. Okay. So not the L4. L4 has left the building. No. L4 has left the building. No. Right. So it's not L4. So what is it? Uh, L5. L5. Yeah. Okay. Because L5 is going to go down and exit below. Yeah. So it's really important as you look at these films. Uh, and you understand what pathologic mechanisms can take place. Is it a far lateral disc formation? Is it foraminal stenosis? Is it uh, lateral recess stenosis? All at the same level, you get two different nerves. Sure. Yeah. And on your intraining exam, you're not going to give you something very obvious. You know, they are going to give you something to really study, really test whether you're able to understand this concept. They might give it to you in the form of the degenerative listhesis versus isthmic listhesis. They might give it to you in the form of um, postlateral discrimination versus a bilateral discrimination. And this is an important concept that you got to know in the OR as well as just your general understanding of anatomy and uh, and taking care of the patients in the office. There's a um, there's a there's a there's a drawing that you do just so okay. you can. So the other thing, so this is like what Messer said, this is five, four is here, three would be here, right? Sure. Where is two? Where would you find two and one? In here, right? In the psoas. That's why when they go through the trans psoas, you, 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 can, you can injure those uh, nerves. And then, so this is five, this is what? That's one, this one, these two? That's two, these? S3, right? S4, S5, right? So you can also hit these disc, these nerves from a very central large focal disc herniation as you go higher. Okay, so these uh, so th that's those things you have to understand. The other the other uh, point I want to make is the frame in. This is the frame in, right? What percent ocean of the frame in is from the disc height? Let's say if you can magically make this disc go down to zero, the height from Say 10, centimeter, 10 millimeters to zero millimeters. What percent of the height of the frame is going now? This ballpark. This is not a trick question. I don't know. Probably 25%. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. You know, so you can imagine if someone completely loses their disc height, the frame and the framing can be compressed. So that's one point of putting interbody devices is it can spread the framing. So this framing looks good. This framing looks good. But what about this framing? So this is the five, four, three, four foramen. Yeah. What's is this normal? No, it looks like there's a differentiation there. Mm -hmm. In the foramen, this is the L3 vertebral body, L3 pedicle. So what nerve root would it be compressing right here? So L3 pedicle. So the, this nerve root is right under the L3 nerve uh, pedicle. L3, L3. L3. Yeah, because it's three pedicle. Right. So if you find the three pedicle, the three root is right up against it, yeah. medial, and it goes right underneath it yeah. into the framing. Okay. So uh, axial cuts. Uh, Dr. Sexton, you want to add anything else? No. Okay. This is L5S1. What, what do you think? Uh, we'll move on to Frank. Frank, what do you think of the uh, axial cuts, L5S1? Yeah, it looks like there's a, a little bit of a central herniation there or protrusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, you know, um, displacing the fecal sac anteriorly a little bit. And there is a little bit more of a um, right-sided uh, protrusion or herniation that might be hitting that exit nerve root. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how about the facets? Are they small? Are they big? Are they normal? Yeah, is there hypertrophy, hypertrophy of the ligament of flavum here in lateral recess? Yeah, they're, they're a little overgrown. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say they're hypertrophy. Okay. And clinically, would you suspect that's a problem? L5S1. 
Yeah. So the L5S1 lateral recess would, would press the blank nerve root. Yeah, so that, that, that would be hitting the uh, L5 nerve as it comes out. The lateral recess? S1, he meant the S1. L5 in the foramen, S1 in lateral recess, yeah. yeah. So he didn't have any foot symptoms, so yeah, no, even though there's some stenosis, it's not too bad. Let's move on to 4-5. Uh, uh, facets large? Yep. Kind of large ligamental flavum hypertrophy? Yep. Is this, could this be compressing the lateral recess here? Yep. Could, but this would be L4-5, which would be the... L5 nerve root. He doesn't have L5 symptoms, right? All right, now to uh, the L3, L4 segment. Move on to, let's move on to Brian. So Brian, L3, L4 segment. Patient has left-sided thigh symptoms. So if you look here, on, on the, particularly on the left, because the, 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 the prior two levels were showing more right-sided pathology, but this time on the, on the um, at this level, you can see we've got left-sided just herniation or, or protrusion. Most it's sort of foraminal with a little bit of extension into the lateral recess, but I think predominantly that's going to be hitting your left sided L3 nerve root. Mm -hmm. Let's say what? Oh, three nerve root. L3 yeah. nerve root. Yeah. If you look at the facets, there's a little bit of uh, ligamentum hypertrophy and mm -hmm. overgrowth. Symmetric, I'd say, though. So, uh, so if the facet hypertrophies anteriorly, would that compress? The foramen? Typically, that's going to hit your lateral recess more so. This would be lateral recess, but it can go into the foramen too. Okay, so this is just a little bit more rostral higher. What do you think of this? What's this thing? Uh, you, again, you can sort of see that the base, the, the, the uh, bulge. You can see that so it's radio, it's radio dense so that from an annulus that's approaching into the foramen. And then far, far lateral, you can see that. That big, big herniation right there. He has a far lateral disc herniation as well, and a foraminal disc herniation. So, um, before you move on, mm -hmm. let me just um, make a pitch I make from time to time that the more specific the information we get about where you're concerned, the more we can um, tilt the report a little bit to help you. Um, by that I mean, this is a perfect example. There was spondylosis at 4.5 and 5.1, and those are the most common levels to have significant disease for you all. And so we're going to be keyed on those in the report. But if you say left L3 root impingement or left L3 radiculopathy, one, we're going to call those maybe mild instead of maybe somebody might get carried away and call those moderate lower down. So that's going to help you. But even more, we go past these. We, we shouldn't, and you won't. Uh, but every now and again, I get a call from one of my spine colleagues saying, could you look again at that left L3 root laterally? And I will have missed something like this because from time to time, we don't get that it's left-sided, that it's L3. Uh, and so, um, and, and I, I, I put in my report that uh, if it's negative, I'll say there's no evidence of left L3 root impingement. That's in my report. So that, that helps you too, not this case, but um, that means that I looked at it and you have in the record that there's not L3 root impingement. Now, if I'm wrong, you give me a call, but, but uh, usually if I'm keyed that way, if I say something like that, I'm not usually wrong about that. I'm sometimes wrong about saying L3-4, no stenosis. And then that's that's a mistake. I'll just, I'll just echo that over the years, probably the most commonly missed finding on an MRI is a foraminal disc herniation by a radiologist. Yeah. Or so or just or that's true. And again, here you guys are focused on the midline lateral recess, but this is very the most commonly missed. So it is important to put as much information, you know, or go back and talk to the radiologist if you suspect something that maybe they did not report. Like in the do the especially if you're an operating patient. If you're going to operate the patient, the record's got to be right yeah. because insurance carriers will pay for it, and also medical legally, it looks weird that the two doctors are not. So it takes time for the practicing physician for us to call. Hey, can you help us? But you have to do it. It's very yeah. important. And you should expect cooperation on the other side if you're right. <laughs> I mean, part, and part of what we're here for is to to balance sometimes. The balance ends up with the radiologist. I like to think sometimes we have a discussion. Could this be significant? And I end up saying, no, I don't think it is. So, you know, you can override that. But 
you know, you're looking for us for an unbiased opinion. The thing about this MRI is, you know, I know a comment was made that this area is the herniation here. I think when I look at this, I think here's the nerve on the other on the right side with fat with the with the nerve. I think this is probably the nerve root with some fat around it, and the herniation mm -hmm. is this. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's herniated disc material. I think that's the nerve root being pushed out of the way. Mm -hmm. Has to be there somewhere, doesn't it? The nerve yeah. has to be there somewhere. Yeah. The, the, the other the other good point you make, Paul, is I have a theory that the MRI is the best picture we can get, but it's not perfect. So you have to think in your mind what's going on in this patient, where do they feel their symptoms, because the MRI doesn't tell you everything. So, so that's that's a, a very important point that Paul makes. So I just um, a far lateral disc herniation is a different surgical approach. It's lateral to the uh, facet. Um, to remove, and this is just a diagram. I, I sent this to Frank today, but anybody's interested in it. It's a very nice description of removing foraminal disc herniations and extra foraminal disc herniations by removing the lateral portion, inferior lateral portion of the pars area and the facet, which which is uh, it uh, keeps you from becoming unstable and getting a pars fracture. Anybody wants it? It's from 2016 from an article from Australia. I can afford it to you. Yeah, I mean, um, the the plane you go through is Wilsey. But Wilsey then, approach, okay, by Leon Wilsey, who is the who described this, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the muscles that you're splitting? Yeah, you're going between multifidus and longissimus, right? Right in that okay. plane. Right. Um, and why is foraminal disc herniations uh, exquisitely painful? Anybody? The the why is it why foramen? They really hurt more than most people, right? Katie, do you know why? Where the dorsal root ganglion lives. Okay. A very classic symptom that patients complain of is burning. When you hear burning in the leg, that is often DRG impingement. And the other thing is, a patient with a far lateral herniation, one of the classic signs of an article written by a guy down in Annapolis, lateral side bending will reproduce the pain. They could have perfectly normal flexion and extension with no pain, but side bending cause their, their leg pain because of the, that's when you're closing the frame. And so think of those two things, burning, patient says, my leg is burning and, and or it hurts the side bend. So in this patient, any comments or questions so far? Yeah, one comment. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm going to put more for the attendees. So uh, when I uh, do a typical posterior lateral disc, you know, there are a lot of different options in terms of retraction. So some people like to put a uh, narrow Taylor retractor gently over the facet joint, or you can put in some type of self-retaining retractor because you have the spinous process there against which you can lever and pull lateral. The issue with these lateral extraforaminal discriminations is uh, where to put the retractor. So Franklin and I had one um, a few weeks ago, and this is the one case I think is great for a tubular system because it's a table mounted system that you can park right over the cars. And you don't need to, because you just have soft tissue all around you. And you don't have anything to lever off of. And uh, I'm curious what you guys, what, what your <coughs> approaches are in terms of what type of retraction you place in there. Because you're coming at it through a wheel seat, and you have no bony structure there to anchor either. So the approach is right through here. I use a shadow line. So the shadow line cervicals, the shadow line cervicals is the same as the tube. You put one uh, and then the other one 90 degrees, like you do in the neck, gives you a perfect view. And it goes really deep. It goes up to 65 millimeters. And then you don't have to deal with the futz with the uh, tubular retractor. The problem with tubular is you're limited in your ability to rotate the instrument by the You can't tube. move the tube. But when you have the, like the, the shadow line, you have more ability, I think, to rotate your hand. You can have your assistant, uh, without detaching the tube, you have assistant just barely nudge the, the shadow line so you can get to wherever you need to go. So it's it's more movable. So uh, we, use, uh, we use a system called Frill B. And, uh, and Frank will tell you as well, but the, the, the advantage of the Frill B is you can pull in each of the blades independently. Uh, you can also expand it. You know, So let's say you just can't quite see enough. You can just kind of tweak it a little bit. It'll expand in any direction that you want. And you can pull, and especially the pulling feature, and then you're kind of. Is it, is it 
different lengths so you can go deeper on the TP. Absolutely. Do we have it here? That's, that's the important thing. Yeah. You want to have two lengths, two different lengths. Two different lengths. lengths. The fry blade system, uh, three different blades, all work independently to be able to pull in any direction with TP. We have the system here? Probe you? You bring it in. All right, that makes sense. Also, I look like extension, like shimmies, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's versatile, so yeah. if you have soft tissue creeping in, you can kind of put these little shims in to push things out of the way. It just keeps things from creeping into your field, and, um, and you just have a life force here as well. Okay, so let me just, there, there's more to discuss, so I have to keep, I have to keep moving. So it, clinically, as an attending, I'm constantly making decisions, and I'm not sure if I'm making the right decision. So I'll tell you what I thought in this man. His, his was medial thigh numbness, which I thought was clearly L3. The L2 root should be the far lateral root that Paul pointed to. He didn't have uh, L2 type symptoms. It was all L3 type symptoms. So I thought his symptoms were coming from the foramen. So because of that, and I've done both, I've done that too. I've done a medial discectomy and a far lateral at the same time to get both if I thought both were symptomatic, but just one was symptomatic. So. I just did the standard discectomy. Um, now, a patient did fine with complete resolution of symptoms. So, and this is what I tell most patients, and I don't know, Messon and Paul, you can correct me. I tell patients it's like a bouncing ball of pain. Usually, they, they come in pre-op, severe pain, pain's gone, night of surgery, next day, comes back a little bit, and just slowly dissipates over the course of six weeks. That's what I usually tell patients. Um, so some time went by, and the patient called um, three weeks post-op with terrible sciatica pain. Um, what would you do, um, Frank, if someone calls you three weeks post-op from a discectomy, terrible sciatica pain? Yeah, I would just um, ask them. If You'll get a lot of these calls in practice. Yeah. What happened? Did they have like a fall? Was there some no sort of fall, nothing, just sciatica. Yeah, are the symptoms the same? Same. Uh, no, it's a little different. Um, well, let's just say same in this case. Okay. So same with the pre-op pain. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I would just have them, you know, take some pain medicine. You gotta ask fevers or chills. It could be an infection. Yeah. No fevers or chills. Any red flags like mm -hmm. that? Yeah. No. No um, peritoneal anesthesia. No loss of bowel bladder control. Mm -hmm. What uh, to do? Then, uh, I mean, just try a little bit of uh, pain medicine or muscle relaxers, see that helps them, or a steroid pack. Mm -hmm. okay. If that doesn't help them, then I would consider getting a re-MRI. Okay, so that's what we did. Steroid pack, pain medications, muscle relaxers. It got worse. So he sent them for, we sent him for an MRI. And um, here's the MRI. Who wants to read, um, maybe Kim. Kim, what do you see on this MRI? That's mid, and this is where we're going lateral. Mm -hmm. yeah, so as we move laterally, it looks like we have a little bit of bulk there, potentially with the herniation. It's kind of hard to tell what the postoperative pain does. Like what about this stuff? It looks like some fluid, but I think that's postoperative pain does rather than. Four weeks post op. Four weeks. Yeah. How about here? Yeah, I mean, it does look like there's a lot of fluid. Corresponding musculature, so it would be potentially concerning for infection. Mm, fluid. Now, okay. Yeah, fluid L3 or 4. We got to keep moving because I have a lot. Axial cuts. This is where the deep. Here's it. Looks like fluid. So, this is the, uh, the post operative lumbar spine MRI is one of the instances we advise IV contrast, gadolinium. Uh, fluid, of course, will not enhance. Inflamed tissues will enhance, so it'll set off on a T1 weighted sequence of dark fluid from a bright enhanced uh, uh, granulation tissue or inflammation. So how about how about? How about off, do you recommend that? Uh, um, good question. We, we we almost never see problems post op here with our spine surgeons, but um, uh, certainly. Uh, people talk about it way out as differentiating scar, which enhances its, don't ask me why scar enhances in the spine, doesn't enhance anywhere else, but scar enhances, so if you're looking late months, uh, you use it to differentiate scar from recurrent disc, this does, does not enhance generally, scar does. Um, I think um, 
you know, any, anywhere from uh, immediately post-op out to uh, out to forever. So I think I think it's always useful. So this, so this, the radiologist uh, called me and said, um, this is a post-op hematoma. And um, I said, look, this guy's, this guy's four weeks out. He, um, uh, he, this should not be a, a post-operative hematoma. I mean, they usually dissolve by now unless he bled into his spine. It, sh it should be gone. I said, this has got to be an abscess. Yeah, we can't tell the difference between... Uh, infected and non-infected fluid. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Follow that What would you say? Now, having said that, white count's normal. Sed rate's 19. No fever. But in this patient, um, he has a uh, history of opiate dependency because although he didn't say it, he was on um, uh, um, methadone and his history of hepatitis C. So he has a history of opiate dependency. So I thought to myself, it's possible this person could be injection medicines, injecting things into himself, and he has an abscess, and he's, you know, he's not, he's not behaving like an abscess. But I can't rule out an abscess. What, what do you guys think? I mean, that was so focal uh, that, that to me, if that was an abscess, I think it'd be, it'd be a, a more diffuse process in my experience. It really looks like a focal, localized fluid collection, and I, I would favor this looks like a hematoma to me. I would have guessed. Four weeks post-op? Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, could he could have loculated it off. I mean, I mean, but the patient, I mean, I, I'm just saying. He did clinically, though, he did great for two to three weeks, and then all of a sudden, boom, severe right. symptoms. I mean, then, then it could also be, I mean, I guess it's possible another herniated fragment, although not a typical appearance. Well, but, that's the topic of today's conference. Yeah, so, I mean. But clinically, this looked like to me abscess. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be, you don't know. But just that it's such a focal area without the disc enhancing, I think that'd be just very unusual in my experience to see that. I have a slightly unrelated question. Do you go back for Bramble for his treatment crisis? No, I didn't. I didn't. And you can see here, it's still there a little bit. Okay. I, I mean, it looks like, uh, like you, you did a push around. Standard discectomy, yeah. And then I went to the outside table to make sure the frame is open. Okay, so just so you know, I thought this was an epidural abscess. And even though he didn't have caught equina syndrome, once you have caught equina syndrome, it doesn't get better sometimes. So for me, this is an emergency. So I took him in and, and uh, expecting abscess, it was all nucleus pulposus, just a massive amount of nucleus pulposus. Mm -hmm which is very hydrophilic, which basically fooled all of us. This was a recurrent disc herniation. So now, if everyone can give our attention to Brett, he's going to discuss recurrent disc herniations after the discectomy. Yep. So uh, I reviewed an AO spine article um, called uh, Recurrent Lumbar Disc Herniation Review. So generally speaking, risk factors include um, current smokers, um, you and all, did a study and showed current smokers have a risk of post-surgical uh, post surgical herniation at 18.5% and an odds ratio of 3.4. Um, so the mechanism is the, uh, it has been, there's a detrimental effect on uh, annulus oxygenation and uh, nucleus pulposus oxygenation recovery. Another risk factor uh, would be obesity, and uh, some studies find that greater than 30 BMI uh, would give you a 12 times more likely uh, uh, incidence of uh, recurrent HMP. Again, higher mean BMIs are correlated uh, in some studies with recurrence. Um, so diabetes would be another risk factor. Uh, there are higher rates of recurrent herniation in diabetics, and uh, the theory behind this is that they have uh, decreased sulfate incorporation um, and uh, into glycosaminoglycans. In addition, uh, they have lower glycosylation rates, so it essentially just changes that the uh, composition of the disc. Some biomechanical risk factors. So uh, patients with greater than 10 degrees of sagittal motion had a recurrence rate of 26.5% compared to those with less than 10 degrees. Uh, who had a recurrence rate of 4.1% in Kim et al. study. Um, so disc height can play an important role, and there's other literature also to support that. So the effects on the actual uh, primary discectomy. Uh, so larger annual defects are uh, can be associated with recurrence, um, and 
the percentage of the disc removed can also be associated with a smaller percentage of disc removed can also be associated with recurrence and variation. Uh, so in terms of management options. Uh, uh, that's a good point is the annular defect. So so do you, what do you do when your standard discs in these uh, uh, mass vein? What's your policy for the annular defect? Do you re take a big knife and every single time annulotomy or when do you do the big annulotomy or when do you just put the pituitary in? Do you have a policy? Because I always try to keep that hole as small as possible so that as possible. Yeah, I mean, because you're really predisposing them both to degeneration and as well as in the long term and a risk of re herniation in the short term. So if the, if the disc herniation is still contained within the annulus or near the 15 plate scalpel and there's just one linear incision, just enough to get a nerve hook in, and I'll use a nerve hook to uh, deliver all the unstable disc fragments into the epidural space. And, uh, and size it. I don't use a pituitary to go in there and, and grab it. I'll just deliver whatever's unstable out into the actual space and, and size that. You got, if, you, if you go in there and see a, a large, uh, like a large defect, but I like to say not creating it, there's just a large defect. Do you ever guys trying to put any type of repair stitch into it? No. There, there, there's, there's been lots of different um, approaches over the years with patches and seals and glues, and all that does is uh, make them do traversing nerve root adherence to whatever it is that you do there. I just found it interesting that limiting discectomies at higher rates of reherniation versus aggressive discectomies. Right, so it's sort of the, the balance of what do, you, what do you do in the short term versus long term. So if, and when I did my training, our attendant used to get a pituitary and, uh, and go in and grab as much as possible. So if you want zero risk of reherniation, what do you do? Take the whole discount. <laughs> in fact, in the old days, 50 years ago, they used to measure it and say you have to take out two grams. Yeah. But this is like 1950. So if you, if you and all the disc was gone. Risk, take the whole disc out and see how that patient does. You know, you're not going to do that. So there's a few management options. Um, repeat discectomy. Um, so you kind of do conventional or minimally invasive. And then you can. Um, fuse or choose not to fuse. Um, so for revision microdiscectomy, um, recent liter literature suggests that patients are generally happy with the results of these revisions. Uh, BS scores after microdiscectomy are typically lower than those uh, after uh, primary surgery. When patients are symptomatic, they typically have uh, reduced BS scores after the revision. Um, so, but there's no significant difference in complications or satisfaction between primary microdiscectomy discectomy and revision surgery in most studies, and uh, it's commonly- That's a training question. Yep. Have you seen it before? Uh, okay. I can't remember I've seen the question, but that's what you used to tell patients. To, to, you, you say, if you herniate, then there's a 95% chance you're going to have success, and if, it, and if you're in that unlucky 5%, you just do it again, and your chance again is 95%. Most people feel pretty good after that. Get the board in return. Right, because it's not intuitive. Right, you, know, you think that the second go around you're going to do worse than the first time, but that makes it a good question now. And so this is commonly considered the primary treatment for uh, recurrent herniation. Um, you can also perform instrument infusion um, if there's deformity, instability, lower back pain. There are other indications. Um, so this would obviously add stability to counteract segmental motion. Um, posterior lateral fusion is typically performed, and they discussed in the article a few they, they, uh, studies that differentiated between approaches. So um, there's a study where they, uh, uh, the patient underwent PLIP with uh, carbon cages and 50 symptomatic patients with recurrent LDH, and uh, there was significant symptomatic relief in six months to five years and 92% satisfaction rate. And just to kind of summarize, because I can go through all of these, there's really uh, no difference on, uh, in most of the literature between the approach that you take, whether you do P lift, T lift, A lift. All of these uh, approaches are uh, show uh, sat high satisfaction rates and significant improvement uh, after revision, um, generally speaking. So uh, there is no uh, obvious best. Best method for revision. Um, 
each revision, as I said, increases the chance of um, uh, increases your uh, chance of improvement, um, and it's just very surgeon based. So they surveyed orthopedic surgeons and uh, 2,500 uh, spine surgeons, and most of them would first treat with the uh, revision microdiscectomy, and then depending on the uh, specific um, you know factors like the uh, first approach uh, in primary surgery and other patient factors and symptoms. And uh, like I discussed before, uh, you know, the uh, alignment of the spine and other different factors, they would choose other approaches. So the, que the question is, um, when do you fuse recurrent disc herniations? First, first recurrence? I mean, many people in the community fuse a first recurrence. Do you do a second recurrence, third recurrence? I have seen patients who have had five discectomies at the same level by like the same surgeon. So that was Tom Emroz's article, which was, I thought, great. He sent out uh, 500 surgeons got back to him. They sent out 2,500, 500 came back and they asked that question, when would you fuse? And I think uh, it was higher likelihood to do a revision discectomy without fusion, the farther out you are in practice. Is it 15 years? And you're more likely to fuse if you have a busier spine practice. If you do more than 200 cases a year, you're more likely to do the fusion quicker. So what is your policy, Mespin? I'll tell you what mine is, but you go first. Recurrent disc herniations. Um, but there are other factors as well. So for example, let's say that... Um, now, why do you say that? Because I, I say that because it's from baseball. But why do you say that? Because I'm worried about, I mean, if you have three, if you have three herniations all at the same spot, first of all, there's data to support that, but there, you're likely to have um, a fourth, or you're likely at that point to have such reduced laminal height that you'll get a radiculopathy from uh, degenerative type of stenosis. So there's evidence to support that after three herniations, you should do something. Uh, the uh, the other issue though is this issue we, you mentioned, uh, Brett, of uh, segmental uh, motion. Now, segmental motion is normal, right? So you don't want abnormal segmental motion. So I always get flex X views on patients that can tolerate that, notwithstanding a, a case like this, uh, to see if there's uh, a lesthesis. Because if there's some abnormal motion where the, the virtual bodies are sliding, that puts them at higher risk of another herniation. So if they come in, let's say they had their surgery done someplace else, surgeons took off two months of the process joint, I get flex X and I see some dynamic instability, then I'll fuse it up to number two. Um, and you're saying strike, you're saying like the, the that's inclusive of the initial herniation? Yeah, so you get one herniation, discectomy, herniation. second herniation, discectomy, third herniation, uh, MIS two left. <laughs> One more point you didn't say is, uh, for me, it's harder the third time. It's harder to find the nerve root. You have to take out more facet. So, I mean, how much facet do you have? I mean, you have to take off at least a couple millimeters of posterior elements to get to the root, to find the junction between the scar and the bone. So I feel after the third time, there's a very high likelihood that it's going to be a recurrence or instability. So I use three, two, because I know technically when I go back in a third time to decompress the dura, it's really technically very hard. And if it's hard for me, higher likelihood of nerve injury and CSF leak. Okay. Are you done or are you anything else going on? Okay. So, well, thanks for coming, Messon. So this is a final, just a final couple things is the different areas where the disc herniations can be. It can be central. Actually, very nice job, Brett. Thanks for doing that. Central, paramedial, uh, lateral, um, Foraminal and extra Um And just uh, the words we use, um, bulging, protrusion, extrusion, and I found, and free fragment, and I found in the literature that if the uh, diameter of the bridge between the disc herniation and the disc is more narrow than the disc itself, it's sometimes called extrusion. Do you, I mean, what, what is your policy for these, uh, Dr. Sexton? Yeah, that, this is exactly it, and I think it's ambiguous between uh, a herniation and a bulge slash protrusion. Uh, I've seen uh, some schemes um, asking to, to meet the extrusion.
new criteria. You talked about narrow of the annulus compared to the, uh, the uh, amount of material outside as, as, a, as a criteria for calling it herniation. But uh, I, uh, I would call uh, the large protrusion a herniation, and I would call the small protrusion a small herniation. So I think the uh, terminology is a little broad, but uh, I go with the degree of stenosis creates mild, moderate, or moderate stenosis. And they're just words. It's, they're all we have to communicate to each other. Um, and so, just, uh, go ahead. Uh, so sometimes I see sequestered, too. Is that the same as the free fragment? Yeah. You just try, okay. <laughs> These are all questions you have, like, on in trainings. And uh, just the disc itself is a continuum of very thick fibrous tissue uh, in the outside to more hydrophilic soft tissue uh, on the inside, nucleus pulposus. And this is a nice uh, view of a normal uh, disc, what it looks like. And just the, the, the area of weakness is the posterior lateral, uh, right next, right near the lateral, re, uh, lateral recess, because the, the fibers are not as thick there. And that's why the disc herniations are always there. So in this case, um, I just did a decompression. And